Welcome to a brand new show called Unpacked, the second chapter. Now, you are very familiar with Unpacked with Lebukile Maboja, and this is not the same show because you spoke and we listened. You wanted to get a bit more information on some of our guests. You also wanted to know where they are and what they're up to. So we decided why not bring you a second chapter where we catch up with some of the most memorable guests or those guests that left us with questions or the guests that left us a little bit confused or the guests we just felt like we cannot get enough of them. So welcome to a brand new season of Unpacked, the second chapter with myself, Lebukile Maboja, and we are here to take you on an exceptional ride. Coming up on Unpacked, the second chapter. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. A lot of things have happened since the last time we spoke. The moment you obviously put your story out, there was some serious backlash. I'm a little fish in a big pond. Why do you care so much? Are you accepting the blackness within yourself? Yes, but how? Marie Mulefe van Heeren joined us in our very first episode of Unpacked with Rileb Gilema Boja. And in this very first episode, we decided we're going to be setting the tone for a certain kind of conversation. Marie opened up to us about how she grew up, but also on her experiences around race. Many of you had questions that you did not understand, but also a lot has happened in the past two years since Marie has joined us. Let's take a look back at her story. I was adopted um, and like I was taken away from, from my, my biological parents and I kind of hated them. So in my mind, I was like, I do not want to do anything about black people. I don't want to learn your language. She's fully, fully, totally, fully my daughter. There's really nothing missing because I did have a mom and a dad. What do you see yourself as? I'm a white person. Um, people didn't understand me and I couldn't even understand me because I, got, I, I had no one to talk to. And she, in her 30s, she only got, she met George. And I'm happy, I'm, I'm, I actually said it's time for them to get married, you know. I'm, I'm years old. <laughs> so much I said pressure. that guy should start paying, he should pay the ball up. Oh and I want a piece of it. <laughs> she is here and she is back to talk to us. Marie Mulefe van Heeren. Was that still her surname? Marie, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lebo. <laughs> you have to clarify, what's the surname today? So because I'm an actress, I can't really change my name or my surname. So it's still Marie Mulefe von Yerden when I'm on TV or radio or any work. But um, officially, I'm now Marie Fenter. Marie Fender, and we'll, we'll get yes. a, a, a into detail around that a little bit later. First of all, I want to start off by asking, how are you doing? I'm actually doing very well. Um, a lot of things have happened um, since the last time we spoke. Um, I got married, bought a house, um, family members died, but we'll delve into that later. I want to um, take you back to the day that I got in touch with you and I said, listen, there's this show I'm trying to do. Um, it wasn't on air. We were just planning to go on YouTube. Uh, why did you agree? Because you're my friend, Lebo. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I agreed because I think I've never told my story. I never openly said how I feel or what's going on in my head. And mm. I felt like maybe that's a, great platform to say what I want to say. Maybe it wasn't the correct way or the words that came out of my mouth wasn't perfect, but that's how I felt. And mm. yeah, that's why I joined. I have to be honest. It's so crazy. You know, you are our first episode in the brand new se series um, that we are producing and sharing. And you are our first episode that we didn't just shoot, that we also went to air with. That usually doesn't happen in production. And that's something people don't know because the first episode is like the pilot where you're mm. checking things out and making mistakes. And initially in your episode, we were going to be pairing you with somebody else with a similar type of story. But it worked out perfectly. Do you feel like it kind <laughs> of worked out perfectly because we also were able to have your family join us in the conversation? 
Yes, I would say it, it worked out perfectly for the show. Yes. It didn't necessarily work out perfectly for my personal life because yes. I think so many people, not only South Africans, there mm-hmm. are people who watch your show over the waters in Namibia, in Botswana, that reach out to me and didn't want to understand my story. Mm. They they didn't want to hear what I said or or maybe they only watched a certain part of the story and made their own minds and were so negative towards me. And I was like, but I'm just telling my story. I'm, mm. I'm a little fish in a big pond. Why do you care so much? Mm. Telling me mm. all these negative things and negative thoughts. I just was, I just said what I wanted to say and I said my mm. story and oh, yes, there were negative com- feedback and comments, but there were a lot of people who are in my, in my like similar shoes that I am in. And mm. that made my heart like bigger. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm not the only one that feels like this. Mm. So, uh, I mean, that that's one of the places I want to start at is the moment you obviously put your story out um, there was some serious backlash in your direction, but I think what's making it even more difficult is the fact that the, it's not just that the episode went on air and you were our first, you went viral and people were just sharing a clip and a portion of the show without the full context. Now, in in more ways than one, that's a really bad thing where people don't see the whole story. But in other ways, what I am happy about is that it created conversations around things that are real, despite what we believe should be and what we believe shouldn't be. So before we get to all of that, um, would you say there was ever a period after the show now went on air? I mean, we were we were talking that you completely regretted sharing your story because of the backlash or did it ever reach a point where you were like, you know, despite the 95% backlash, there was 5% of love and understanding and me, as in you understanding that this was a really important conversation to have. That is the reality for many people who aren't able to articulate it in a politically correct or acceptable way by society. I think for me, if, I, because I never dealt with the feelings or the notion that I identify with the Afrikaner community. I've never really 100% delved into that feeling and understood what I said on air. So in the first part, yes, the 95% of people giving me negative feedback really hurt me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, And then eventually after... All my family members and friends told me, you know what? There's always going to be people who are negative. Look at the positive side of, of, of your story. So yes, later on, I realized, okay, don't just look at the negatives. There, there are people that I'm helping actually as well. And, and yeah, so now I'm looking at the 5% of the people who gave me positive feedback and who loved my family. So yeah. So how would you say being on the show and it going on air um, changed your life? It cha- it didn't really change my life because I didn't I didn't change I I'm I'm, I'm I still feel the way I feel um, I did marry a white guy as I said <laughs> um, yeah it's no nothing has changed <laughs> yeah <laughs> nothing has changed per se but in my mind I do want to learn to speak to Anna mm. I do want to have more um, black friends mm. I I'm open to accepting the black community or the black culture mm. um and slowly but surely I'll get there but I think at the point we we had our first conversation I wasn't ready I I I didn't want to do it and I think it was mainly because I felt so awkward and bad and negative towards my previous family so mm. I wasn't ready to 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 accept um anything that has to do with the black community but now I'm ready and open and I'm willing to learn. So on, on that note, then, you know, what, what would you share then you have learned since that time? Just in terms of, I mean, you, you you mentioned maybe how you said things, you could have said it differently. What could you have said differently or what have you looked back on and said, okay, this is what I've learned and this is maybe what I would do or say differently. And I'm not 
saying the part of articulating who you are, but when you share your experience with general public? The hard question. Mm. Um, For example, like, you know, one of the things that you, you said then and you are still saying now, you're using the language of accepting the Black community. And the way I, um, in my mind, process that as is because of the association with your parents and the role that they continued to play in your life of not being providers, basically not taking care of you, um, that your grandmother had to take you in, that the Fanirans had to take you in, and then later on in your life when you're starting to build a life for yourself, the only engagement was sort of around you need to be taking care of us. So in my mind, that association of Black community is with what you were experiencing with your parents and the other family. Would you say that you would still um, use that connection as the same thing when you say accepting the Black community? I think I'm accepting the Black community, but not necessarily accepting my own biological family. Mm. Because Mm. after the show, um in in 2021 my grandma died Mm. and I went to the funeral it was amazing with my first black funeral it was it was Mm. spectacular it was something different that I've never experienced but anyway and at the funeral um I rekindled with my my mom my dad and my brother. So it was the first time I saw them in many many years. Wow. And and had they watched the episode? I don't think they've watched the episode, mm-hmm. but they connected after the after the funeral. They connected um, on Facebook, mm-hmm. you know, with me. And uh, I really thought they've changed. It's been like more than twenty years, but nothing has changed. The first question that my mom asked me is, "Listen, we need money for electricity." Mm-hmm. And I was so sad and about it. I was like, "It's the first time that you see your real your first daughter, and that's the first question you're going to ask me." Not sorry that I wasn't there for any of your birthdays. Mm. Sorry that um, I couldn't take care of you or anything like that. Mm. All you wanted me was to help you. And they didn't even see the, they, I was at a funeral and still they're asking me. Yeah. So that, that, like I said, I'm accepting the black community, but not necessarily accepting my own biological family. Are you accepting the blackness within yourself? Yes, but how? Hmm. I'm 37 years old, was never taught anything about the black community. So now I'm almost 40 and I have to I have to do it myself yeah. without any guidance. So it's hard. Hmm. So one of the um, questions that was asked was around the fact that, you know, if... Granny was a black woman. Are you saying that she never taught you anything that was black culture or black anything because the life she was living was not that at all? That's the thing. My grandma, I think she was young, like 17 or 18, when she started working for the Van Yerden family. Mm. And they taught her the Afrikaans culture. Mm. So she only spoke Afrikaans to me. Mm. So yes, my granny is black, but she's she's speaking more Afrikaans to me than mm. you know. So where I didn't have any my my I, I, I was in a white family. My only black connection with which is my grandma. She spoke Afrikaans to me, and she embraced the Afrikaans culture. I think because mm. she wanted me to thrive so much in the Van Yerden family. She never really thought of you know what you still need to remember where you come from. I never had that. So, yeah. And, and I think I think it's so important that um, we, we, we mention those dynamics because when we speak about Afrikaans being such a widely spoken language, one would assume it's spoken by Afrikaners, but there are many black and colored communities that consistently speak Afrikaans as a first um, language, and we don't even need to delve into our history as to how that came to be. At the yeah. at the end of the conversation, that is what is, and that is your reality. 
um, and, and the life that you are living. So now that you might be a mom someday or might decide to be a mom someday, what would you like to, to teach your future children about their identity and where they come from? I think um, my dad said in our previous conversation that he regrets not teaching me Tswana or not mm. teaching me anything about my my culture. Um, and I would hope that one day when when I have my own child that I've learned enough to tell my child, you can be whatever you want to be, mm. but I've learned this, not to exclude any culture or any race or any whatever um so yes i definitely my child's not going to only speak afrikaans and english definitely not um they're going to learn different things from different cultures and mm. different communities so definitely yes i'm i'm not going to exclude anything when i teach my child to be a better human mm. uh, i just had a thought right now in my mind that if you were to have a son i feel like his second name would be mulefe I never even thought of that. It just um, crossed my mind r- randomly. I was like, oh, I can see you having a son whose second name is Mulefe in honor of your grandmother. Well, the only thing that I, with the, me and George have thought is when we have a daughter, her second name will be Maria because my grandma's name was Maria. So definitely I'm going to honor my grandma. Sense. Yes. <laughs> so while, while we are on that, I mean, you've lost your father and you've lost your grandmother um, since we last spoke. That's in the space of of two years, speak to me about what was happening in your life when you lost each of them and how that that impacted you. My grand died in 2021. It was just after COVID. Um, And my dad died in 2022. So the first time when my grandma died in 2021, me and George just got engaged. Mm. So for me, it was almost like I feel her time was done. She was on this earth to make sure that I have a future with someone that I'm that will never be alone. Mm. And then her journey was, was done. And then my dad died literally like two months after we got married. So mm. his journey was done, you know. So I feel like he just made sure that I'm okay and I have a husband the same as my grandma. So um, it was, it was, uh, I really miss them still to this day Mm -hmm. because they, they shaped who I am and they were really supportive of my decisions. And, you know, so it, I felt like I was on such a high in my life. And then I had to lose these two wonderful people in my life. And I feel like sometimes it's really, really unfair, but I understand why they, their journey was done. I have to be honest, I was so heartbroken on your behalf um, because I I knew how much your grandmother meant to you, but also, you know, your father, Um Umkwabas, and... um, No, my father was Um Umklasi. Umklasi. My brother was (laughs) Kwabas. Yes. (laughs) And um, I just remember, you know, especially from our episode and, and many of the comments reflected, that family loved her like um, she was their own. So when you think about having experienced two loves, the one that's biological and the one that you were chosen, um, what can you share just in reflection on that? I think I'm super blessed and I'm grateful for the fact that I had so many people who love me and still do. And now that I'm I'm married, I have a whole new family. Um, it's funny because I lost a big part of my original family. And like literally two months after that, God gave me a whole new family and more people that could love me as well. So yes, I am I'm happy, I'm blessed, and I'm so thankful for this journey that I'm on. How has your husband's family received you I would assume that they also may have come across the episode but having a personal relationship with you how have they been receptive to you especially because your story is is quite unique 
to be honest, in the beginning, it wasn't as easy as I would hope. Um, mm. Because I thought my family is white, so, and they're accepting of me and my decisions and who I am. But it wasn't as easy for George's family. Um, mm. But it didn't take long for them to accept me. Um, and and now I have uh, two extra sisters and I've got, an, I've got two extra moms now and a dad. Mm. So eventually like any it's 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 a hard conversation you know to have with them um George had to to take his dad out and explain to him like this is the choice that I made and either you join us or you don't join us and luckily they they joined and they they are super accepting of me and they love me and they call me their daughter and yeah can I ask you um a, a really tough question you know, as you're speaking and I'm wondering, uh, it's, and this is coming from somebody who has also dated outside of her race and dealt with a family, um, that, that feeling of wanting a family to be accepting of you. But I'm wondering, in, in your situation of the family getting to know you and choosing to support you, do you think at all that a big part of the choice to accept you is because you are already cultured in a culture they are familiar with. Definitely. I think um, not to be crude or, you know, if I, sorry for the word, if I was a domestic or if I wasn't, um, I didn't go to school or whatever, I think the decision to accept me would have been way harder. But the mm. fact that I speak Afrikaans and my culture is Afrikaans, it's an easier choice to make and mm. it's, it's easier to accept me. So, and, yeah, and of definitely. course, the, the family didn't have to, you know, now gather uncles for Lobola negotiations. <laughs> well, I don't I don't think they, they would know. About that yes. like, yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they, I paid for my own wedding. We, me and George paid for our own wedding. Yes. So, you know, yeah. Okay. Are you ready for some questions that had come through from some of the viewers? Okay. Some viewer okay. feedback with you. A viewer on YouTube at Mini K240 commented, Can we acknowledge how beautiful her adoptive fa- family is? They are kind and warm hearted people that embody what it means to be Christian. I can imagine not everyone from their community supported their decision to adopt a child of color. How does that message make you feel? What would you like to say to Mini K240? Mini K, thank you so much for your message. And yes, um, my dad, Classy, had so many backlashes when, when they decided to adopt me. So many family members that didn't accept me in their house um, in the the beginning. But my dad didn't care. My dad, my mom was like, this is what God wanted us to do. And I don't care what you think, but we're still going to do it. So, yes, I am grateful that they didn't listen to, to, to people who didn't know better. And they listened to God and they made that decision. And that's why I'm here now. All right, let's look at another one. Um... A viewer question from at Caddy Pratt, Pratt TV. I hope I'm saying that right. Caddy Pratt V. They say, I wish Lebhile would have asked if your biological parents ever asked for forgiveness, if they ever tried visiting you while you were young. Hmm. That is the question. Mm-hmm. Did they ever, did your parents ever ask you for forgiveness? No. I think that's why I'm still have this iffy feeling about them. Like I said, the first time of when at the at my grandma's funeral, um, they didn't say sorry or they didn't try to connect with me. All mm. they wanted was money, and it's not like I'm like a rich person that I have all the money in the world. So I, it makes me sad that they. They couldn't think of apologizing or trying to be in my life. And now I don't want them in my life. So there's this qu- there's this um, thing that my therapist shared with me when I was also dealing with issues with different types of relationships in my life. And I kept saying, 
Why can't they just see? It's so obvious. Why can't they just apologize? And they said, they asked me a question. So I'm going to ask you the same question, which was, do they have the capacity to apologize? They probably do not have that capacity. Mm -hmm. But does that make me, should I say, it's okay, you don't have to apologize because you don't have the capacity? How must I feel about it? Mm. Um, it's, you can, you watch TV, you see other people in relationships, you have relationships with other people. Mm. Do you want to tell me you are in your 40s or your 50s and you do not understand the fact that you have to say sorry? Mm. You, it's not like my mother gave me away. She just didn't care. And mm. I, I I was busy dying and that's why my grandma had to step in. Mm. I mean, yes, at that age, my mother was very young. She was in her teens, understandably. Two years later, she had another child, which is my, mm. biological, my biological brother. And she took care of my brother, which is fine. But then now you are a mother of two. Mm. I assume, I don't know, I'm not a mother myself, so maybe I can't even say this, but I assume when you are a mother, something happens in your brain and in your body where you become an adult. Yes, you might be 17 or 18 or 19, but you become responsible for, for this little child. Mm -hmm. Something has to happen in your brain where you, where you think of, maybe I should apologize for the way I treated my firstborn, mm -hmm. where I didn't take care of her, whether it's to my grand or mm -hmm. to me or um, classy and them, but Nothing in that nature ever happened and I, mm. I haven't received an apology. I hear you. I hear you completely. And I think um, at the end of the day, as, as adults, we all have to choose how we want to engage with people, knowing and understanding where they are at. And if people are not even at a point where they can see there's anything to apologize for, one can say, actually, the situation is not okay for me. So up until certain things are done or have happened or certain processes are being understood, this is the relationship I'm going to have with you, which is to love you from afar. Um, how are your brothers doing? Good. Um, I hardly see two of my brothers because they live in Australia. Um, and Quibus is still in PE, still teaching. He's doing very well. And then my other brother, Sampi, he's in Pretoria. I see him every now and then, but they're very well. And how do they feel about the new family? Because literally it's two families coming together. Yes. Um, I remember, I think it was, I think it was Quibbers who told George, like, listen, she's got four brothers. So you better take care of her or we'll take care of you. So, <laughs> no, they, they love George. They love their family. Um, no, everything is really, really well. We had received a comment that actually asked if you would document your story in a book. And I think I mentioned something along those lines before as well. Uh, would you consider still doing that or exploring that? You know, it actually, it, it saddens me because my dad always wanted us to write a book. Mm. And I'm, I'm, one of, I'm a very big procrastinator. Yes, I'll do it one day. Yes, definitely we'll do it. And now I don't have that opportunity anymore. And even my grandma, the three of us would have done something because I think it would have been a great story to read. But now I'm alone and I can't remember all the stories that they told me. Yeah, so I wish I could. But definitely if there's a writer out there that <laughs> wants to reach out and help me write the story, I would definitely do it. Look, uh, we will be interviewing you in a year's time and talking about your book. <laughs> I'm putting it out to the universe. In closing, what is the the last thing that you would just like to share with all of the unpackers out there? Thank you for watching the full version of the first episode. Thank you for the, the 5% that was so positive and that had my back and that just spoke to my heart. And for the other 95% that didn't accept me or didn't understand my story, it's okay. It's okay. I forgive you and you have a space in this world too. Thank you, Marie. I mean, from 
all of us, not just myself, the entire team, we are so grateful that you helped to build this show because it created a platform, you know, for many other people to share other stories. And um, I appreciate the the sacrifice and the cost that it came at for you and also for your family. But I personally am just so grateful. I mean, we were able to be on national TV. Uh, we were able to to have over 200 episodes of Unpacked. And you are such a big part of just setting the tone for all of that. And I will be forever indebted to you because I do feel this show is not just a space of learning and sharing. It's also a space of healing. And I can only hope that somewhere in your journey that we have played a part in that healing and self-understanding. We have. Thank you so, so much. And yes, I've I've read all the comments and the messages. And most of the comments were, I need healing and I need to to reach out to to other people that can that that can teach me about the black community and I will do it and I want to do it. At the time of the interview, I might not have known that I needed the healing or you know, but now thanks to you and the unpacked viewers, I'm I'm getting better. Thank you. Well, there you have it, uh, Marie Molefe van Heerden, now Fender. Our very first episode on Unpacked with Rile Bukhile Maboja. Our very first episode shot, gone to air, gone viral, made headlines and made people talk. I can only hope that from here on out, the conversations continue not to criticize, not to hurt, but also to understand and for us to not just have tolerance, but for us to really go back to the essence of those universal themes of being human, because all of us just want to be seen, all of us want to be heard, and at its best, we want to be accepted and we want to be loved. Thank you so much for joining us on our very first episode of Unpacked, the second chapter with Rile Bukhile Maboja. Can't wait for you to enjoy the rest of the season. And of course, don't forget to comment down below, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so, and click the notification bell so that you can be notified very early on on when the next episodes are out. Until next time, bye. Next time on Unpacked, the second chapter. 2.2 million or whatever people have seen my face. I did get a confession that says that he did rape me, but nothing has changed. Would you say he loved you? No, I don't think there's anyone that that man loves. But at the end of the day, we must all try and learn to just forgive. Is there anybody that you would love to see on the second chapter? Maybe there's a question that you think I should have asked or something that was burning after you watched and you wished you could have the guest back. Maybe you were confused or maybe you felt like mm -mm, there's definitely more to the story. Comment down below and let us know who you'd like to see, which story you'd like to revisit, which guest you'd like us to invite back for Unpacked, the second chapter. Mm -hmm.